Welcome to Jeffrey Mays's talk. We're really glad that you all are here getting to enjoy our summer teacher training event this week. I hope you've been enjoying your session so far and we're hoping to see you throughout the week. Uh, my name is Emily Cook and uh, I have been an employee with Novari Science and Math for quite a while now and um, have been with CAP um, since Novari was acquired by CAP at the beginning of this calendar year. Um, I'm going to introduce Jeffrey before we get started. Um, let me first remind you, you know, your typical Zoom reminders. Can you please keep yourselves muted? Um, we're going to be using the chat box as is typical for um, conversation and questions. So please feel free to use that um, to chat with other people in the talk or to ask me questions. Uh, do remember that you can chat with me directly um, by choosing my name or you can chat with everyone in the group if you have kind of a general thought or question. But please do put questions there throughout the talk that we're going to be collecting for Q&A. Um, Jeffrey's going to leave about 20 minutes at the end of the talk for um, Q&A so we can get your questions answered in more detail. Um, but let me introduce him before we get going. Um, Jeffrey has been with Novari Science and Math uh, since, its, since its birth um, about 11 years ago. And uh, he also holds a BS in computer science. He's got an MDiv degree and he also just finished an MFA in creative writing this spring. Um, Jeffrey has also been a classroom teacher, um, so he's got a variety of experience um, and he is uh, one of the most knowledgeable people about Novari Science and Math. Um, we are really excited to have you here at, our, at his talk today and um, again, please use the chat box for your questions. I'm going to turn it over to Jeffrey now um, for his talk. Thanks, Jeffrey. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, so glad to see all of you. Thanks for thanks for um, joining us for this uh, for this talk. Um, the title, um, some of you may have seen it, maybe you maybe some have not, but it's building a premier science program. So I am not talking so much about Novari um, science curriculum as I am. Um, maybe I hope to, that to be just very practical um, thoughts and advice for you and uh, for use in your school. Um, I, I realize I'm, I'm probably talking to a, a lot of experienced classroom teachers here. There may be some who are just starting out, uh, but there may be some veteran teachers here who could possibly even uh, give this talk better than I could. So, um, but uh, I do benefit from <clears throat> talking to teachers all around the country every day um, to help them solve problems and implement a premier science program in their schools. So um, it's like I've been in scores or hundreds of classrooms um, helping people think through issues. Uh, I, as Emily said, I think you said I was a teacher. As I, I've been a teacher uh, in the past. Um, teaching was my very first job out of college. I taught in a public school, uh, taught uh, middle school math. Um, I was certified to teach math and computer science, um, but due to my further degrees, I was qualified to teach at Regent School of Austin. I taught Bible and um, apologetics and uh, ancient history for there for there for a few years. I've also, I have taught um, science and math and uh, who knows, I kind of lose track um, of what all, but uh, uh, my very first teaching job was actually I, I misspoke. My first teaching job out of college was a substitute teacher at my own high school while I was uh, waiting for my wife to graduate. She had one semester left to graduate and then we got married. Um, and then my first full-time job after that was teaching for a while. So we go way back, even though I was a computer man for a number of years and a computer guy and a pastor and um, lots of different things. <clears throat> so, uh, but now I'm in the world of science uh, education. So, so uh, yeah, Emily, I think is posting a handout there. If you if you care to follow along, you can um, with my outline. Um, okay, 
All right, well, I'm just going to jump right in. I do have two or three slides I'm going to pull up shortly um, to illustrate some things, but for the most part, it's just me you're going to be watching. Um, let's start with the goal of a Christian science program. Um, this is going to have a strong determining factor on the topics that are studied in your school. <clears throat> you may just, you know, do you just follow the uh, the outline of the textbook? And if so, what what textbook are you using? Um, it'll have a, a, a large impact on on what gets covered. Um, as you all probably have reflected, if you're if you're teaching in classical school, no doubt you have had opportunity to reflect on on the fact that um, in in the public school or in secular education environments. Um, what they're doing is, uh, what they see themselves doing is uh, preparing uh, people to enter the workforce. Um, they're, they're, training, they're training students to become economic units and uh, to uh, step into some career. And when that's your goal, you're going to study different things. You're, you know, if, when that's the goal, then there's really not much use for history. Uh, and English becomes uh, how, to, how to write a good business letter or a technical paper not um, Shakespeare. So um, we classical educators uh, think differently about these things. Um, and uh, the goal, <clears throat> the goals might be, you know, uh, a secular school might be teaching about semiconductors and robotics and stuff like that. Uh, but they may never actually talk about Newton's three laws of motion. Um, or if they do, it's a uh, it's kind of a in passing because that's not really important information to them. But we think it is because um, it, uh, it, it teaches you more than just uh, a some job skill that you might need. Um, another goal of a Christian program is um, to, in, to inculcate or to foster um, uh, respect and stewardship. Um, obviously, this flows out of uh, the creation story, uh, the Garden of Eden, uh, God telling Adam and Eve to um, the, the commission to the, their first their first task was to tend the garden. Um, there's something there's an idea implicit in tending the garden. If you've ever thought about it, that means that the garden, the, the world that God made, he made it wild. He made it untamed. He made it to overgrow. And uh, then he put man in it to be in charge of it and uh, tame things. And so the whole, what we call civilization, building cities and farming and uh, agriculture and stuff like that is really, is a, it's tending the garden. It's just taking that tend the garden mandate and extrapolating it um, to the whole world, build cities, build bridges and stuff like that, uh, create music and art and uh, literature. Um, so, but stewardship is the Christian way to look at it. We, and so your science program, I'm sure you want to have a stewardship aspect to that. You're teaching your students to, uh, to love the world. Um, that's my next point, fostering a love for the world. And uh, this is definitely classical and it's definitely Christian. Um, we don't tend to take care of what we don't love. And we don't love what we don't know. So part of the goal of our well, the motivation for a Christian science uh, program is so that students will know the world that they live in and come to love it so that they can then take care of it. Um, science education in the, in the Christian, uh, in the classical uh, schools uh, has, has sometimes, sometimes not always, but sometimes feels a bit like a, a stepchild uh, because uh, it's not one of the seven liberal arts. And uh, I mean, unless you count astronomy and you know, maybe <laughs> mathematics, but um, uh, it, it, so, and it's fairly new, you know, it's, 
it used to be philosophy, it used to be a category of philosophy, um, but it's kind of come into its own in the last few hundred years. But, um, but anyway, um, so oh, where I was going with that, uh, science teachers have sometimes had to sort of had a little, you know, identity moment, like, why am I here? And um, where, what place does science have in a classical school? Um, well, this is where it belongs. This is where it comes from. It's become, it comes from a, from a Christian standpoint, because we have been getting, given certain um, commissions by the Lord uh, with regard to the world not only to, re to respect it and take care of it, but also to study it. You, you'll find um, scriptures, I don't have my fingertips right now, but um, scriptures in, in the Psalms especially, which, which talk about um, his works are made to be studied. They are loved by all those who study them. So um, loving the world is definitely, uh, 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 substantiates our calling as teachers in a Christian school. Um, so then uh, the last thing under this question of the goal of Christian science program is we want to foster students to have a mature engagement with the established culture of science. Um, if, you were in, um, if you were in John's presentation, which was just a, a couple of hours ago, uh, he mentioned one of our favorite metaphors, our favorite sayings, and I say this all the time, um, we want to our goal. We want to draw students upward into the adult world of scientific uh, and engagement and investigation. We're not taking the science and patch, packaging it for the children. We're not dumbing it down so that they, you know, putting it on the bottom shelf. We're saying, students, there's a there's a whole world of scientists out there who are doing this world this work, and they speak a certain language and they know certain skills and. Um, they engage with each other in a certain culture with things like peer review. Um, and uh, you're, we want you to, we're gonna draw you up and bring you into that world, but there's a lot of preparation you gotta do to do that. Um, one, of the, one of the things, mature engagement with an established culture, of, I mean, your students, they may not go on to be scientists. They may just go, wanna go study Shakespeare. You know, uh, but uh, but they do need they they need to at least know how what science is about and how it works. Even if you're going to be a journalist or something or an economist, you still need to know uh, how science works. So it's important for every student to have these things. And by mature engagement, I mean respecting how scientists do their work, uh, overcoming and, and, and leading, leading our Christian students to overcome what, uh, what often shows up as suspicion towards science uh, in our churches. Um, I've, heard people, I've heard people be very um, wary and suspicious uh, towards science made for various reasons. Um, uh, suspecting that scientists have a, they're all atheists and they have a, an agenda for undermining Christian faith. Um, and that, that's simply not true. Uh, there, there are atheists out there and there are science, scientists who are atheists, but they, they tend to really not really think much about Christianity. If they're atheists and it's, it's a, it's an idea, it's a myth that, that we can sometimes encounter among Christians that, that they're out to get us, that, the, Christ, that the, the world of science is out to get us. And so we need to, you know, we need to circle the wagons and uh, not let them, not let them uh, you know, indoctrinate our children. <clears throat> um, but once you, those of you who have actually worked in the sciences know that that's not really how it works. Uh, and if you know about peer review, I think it's probably important that you talk, your, talk to your students about what peer review is and how it helps science progress and ar ar arrive at, at valid conclusions. If there's a, if there's a, a new a cutting edge of some research going on and 
scientists in the United States, various states, and scientists overseas in, in all countries around the world, if there, if, if there are ver various teams that are all independently working on the same kind of question, then when one of them publishes a paper about it, the others take a certain glee in taking it, attacking it, pulling it apart, and trying to find its weaknesses it's kind of, it's kind of humor. It's not humor. Uh, I guess it's not humorous, but from the outside, it kind of is because there's this uh, camaraderie, if you will. But it's a, uh, it's, it's usually good natured, and sometimes it can be not good natured. But there's this account, built-in accountability in the peer review system that uh, when you see how that works and how scientists critique each other's articles, then you you just gotta realize no, no scientist is gonna trot out something that's un, untested, because if they do, they know it's gonna get torn apart. Um, so that will help, that's, a, that's one, one concept, peer review, uh, in, in helping students to maturely engage. I have some other things uh, to say about that um, later on, but um, that is certainly a goal of a Christian science program more than just in more than just teaching principles of science uh, cultivating the heart cultivating the the culture of the student with respect to science um i do i i may have a small amount of overlap with things that john said in the in the 10 30 the 10 30 session but um not very much uh but this this next um, section might be uh, somewhat overlap. Um, I want to talk about a better high school science sequence, and for this, I have a, I have a, um, what do you call a PowerPoint slide that I want to share with you. So let me share my screen here. Where is it? All right, share, there we go. Okay, I, I wanna hasten to say that um, this is a recommended sequence. Uh, you do not have to use this sequence to, um, to use Novari curriculum, but this is just the one that we like. And I'll give you a few reasons why we like it. Um, what you can see here is two pathways or tracks, um, a grade level or standard pathway, and then an accelerated pathway. And then this, the corresponding si uh, math that aligns with that particular science. Um, this, for those of you not familiar with this, uh, you'll notice that there's a physics-based course in the ninth grade for both the grade level and the accelerated pathway. ASPC stands for Accelerated Studies in Physics and Chemistry. And uh, we have a book by that title, um, or the grade level is the Introductory Physics book. Um, now these are both at the beginning of the high school sequence. Um, and then you can see, which I'll elaborate on in a moment. And then you can see in, um, on the grade level, we go to biology, then chemistry, and then what you do in 12th grade is usually an elective. Most, most states require three semesters of, of science, and that leaves you open to do what you want to do in, the, in that fourth year. Uh, you can do anatomy, physiology, environmental science are popular options for 12th grade. In the accelerated side, we would say ASPC in the ninth grade, and then chemistry next, and then biology after that. So the chemistry and biology are swapped on 10th and 11th grade between the two tracks, which I'm gonna explain. And then you have, we have our physics modeling nature is a, is a sort of, it's an advanced physics book or a physics two, if you will, um, that we publish or, or another option for an accelerated track would be a molecular biology. And you can see the, uh, the math alignment there. So um, why do we, 
recommend uh, the Physics First program. We have several other videos on this on the CAP website and on the, on the YouTube channel, which we elaborate on it uh, at length. Just briefly, I'll say, the pedagogical advantages of this are very strong and compelling. Uh, we're talking about an Algebra one based physics class here, first of all. Uh, only Algebra one calculations involved. But in a physics class at the beginning of high school, students learn a lot of skills and a lot of concepts that are foundational for the latter other sciences that come later. They learn um, concepts such as uh, motion, work, heat, transfer, energy, the atomic model, um, motion, uh, electromagnetism, on and on, um, wave motion. Uh, and then they learn skills as well, mathematical skills like um, unit conversion, scientific notation, significant digits. Uh, this is a chance for them to, to learn and memorize all the metric prefixes and get them firmly in their head and using them regularly. Um, but it's very fundamental and the math is not too hard. It's just algebra one. And so um, you get that you get that math foundation done and then you're ready to go on to whichever chemistry or biology next. Now you can see the way we have published it and the way we recommend it on this chart here. Again, your your mileage may vary. You do not have to follow this if you don't want. But why do we why the 10th and 11th grade? A lot of people want to know what's be, what's behind this, the switch the switch between biology and chemistry in 10th and 11th grade. The reason for that is because in your chemistry class, you get into a little bit of algebra two. When you get to acids and bases in chemistry, it calls for logarithms and exponential functions. So when you're taking chemistry, you, it helps if, you've are, if you're concurrently in algebra two. And those grade level students, they're usually taking geometry in the 10th grade. And so we would put biology before that. But then the accelerated folks, they can do chemistry before biology. Okay, that's, the, that's our kind of published recommendation. Personally, I think that there is an even, there is an additional advantage to putting chemistry before biology. So you're looking at that accelerated pathway. Why would I say that? Because uh, much of modern biology is very chemically based. You biologists know this. Just think DNA, proteins, enzymes, it's all chemistry these days. Um, so I think there'd be an advantage to doing chemistry before biology. Now, if, you're, if your students are on the grade level pathway, you can do it like I have here on this screen, but if you wanted to do chemistry before biology, you could. All you'd have to do is pause somewhere in the spring semester, cover logarithms, and then go on. You can coordinate with your math teacher if you want to do that, and, uh, and then you'd be fine. The mathematics and chemistry is not that complex overall, just that one moment in that chapter in the spring when you do acids and bases, you have that issue to deal with, but you could pull it off. Um, all right, so let's keep going here. Um, where are your lectures? Okay, I, I covered most of my points there. Um, in middle school, oh, my chart didn't have middle school in it, but basically for middle school, we have two books, physical science and earth science. This, the, the sequence of those is not important. Um, there's not a prerequisite one for the other. The only, the only consideration, if you're gonna do a physics first uh, sequence in high school, you might wanna put physical science in the seventh grade so that it's not back to back eighth grade, ninth grade, you got physics based classes, put it in seventh grade, do eighth grade earth science, just break things up a bit. But that's the, really the only consideration that I would have for that. We do intend to publish a life science book. Uh, we have a writer who's working on that, been working on it for a while. Um, uh, it's just, a, you know, getting a book published is a, 
is a long pipeline and it takes a lot of work. So um, it's still going to be probably, I would say, not less than two or three years before a life science book shows up. But that could be something you would do in, in uh, sixth grade. Uh, and, and elementary, um, I don't have a lot to say about elementary school uh, science, but since we're talking about your program, your science program for the whole school, presumably, and if you're a department chair, you may have um, oversight over the whole, the whole school. We like to say that the, you know, the, the, the last thing you wanna do in elementary school is sit a kid down at a table with a book and say, this is science. Um, so we would, we would say you need to, kids need to be outside. They need to be handling things and learning and splashing around in the pond and collecting jars full of tadpoles and, um, playing with magnets and stuff like that. Um, in John's book that's called Teaching Science so that students learn science, you can find it on the CAP website. It's only about 160, 70 pages or something, but there's a chapter in there that talks about, um, considerations for the elementary school might be a, a good reference for you if you need more information on that. Um, but there's a, there's a list of um, concepts and experiences that students, it would be good if they had had these experiences by a certain grade level. So by sixth grade, they should have had a chance to, I don't know, con connect a wires to a battery and a light bulb, and that, that kind of thing, just um, standard experiences that would be good for them to have had. Um, but it's, it's all about fostering the wonder, the natural bottomless pit of wonder that exists in the world um, and not squelching it by turning science into an academic enterprise too early. Um, they're, they're seventh, eighth grade, that's a good time to start introducing formal study of science, but um, not too early. Uh, you want to you keep them going. Uh, I'm going to move on here. I've I've started to say some things already about, well, mastery learning. John talked about it some in the last session. Um, mastery learning, if you haven't heard, it's just really one of the big things we're, we're about at Novare Science and CAP. Um, and again, John talked some about it before, but I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have too much time to go into it here. There is a class on Classical U. If you hadn't heard about this yet, John took his, um, it used to be called the Summer Mastery Workshop, and we used to offer it here in where I live, which is Austin, Texas, as a two and a half day seminar. Where people would fly in around the country. Um, the, it was $350 and two and a half days of high intensity training. Um, and when CAP acquired Novare last uh, January, um, the, one of the first things they wanted to do was take that, take that workshop and film it and make it available to people. It's now available much more cheaply. I see someone asking the question how much it is. I do not know. Maybe Emily can track that down. It's not, it's not a lot. I think if you get a, a Classical U subscription, uh, you can have access to it. But um, I don't know that number. But it's, it's actually quite affordable now. It's about 17 sessions that are and, and a total of about uh, 12 to 15 hours of, of material. I uh, highly recommend that for an in-depth treatment of what mastery learning means to us. What it means, in short, is long-term retention of course content. That's really what we're getting down to here. Uh, breaking the cram, pass, forget cycle. Um, I, if, if you spend any time with us at Novari, you will hear these phrases over and over. It tends to be what we talk about all the time. Um, if you haven't heard, everyone, everyone knows what this means as soon as I say it. Cram, pass, forget. Oh, yeah, I know what that means. You cram for the test, you pass the test, and then you forget what you crammed with just within a couple of weeks. It's probably how most of us went through school. Um, but it's a, it's a bankrupt way of doing school uh, uh, just on the face of it, you can see. I mean, what, I mean you, get to the, you get to the third week of June in the summer, uh, in a typical school year and kids are forgetting just it's just pouring out of their heads because that chapter three test that they took back in October that's ancient history and they uh, so they're not retaining the content what we mean by learning looks like a student who retains that material long term and by long term I mean not just six months I mean three or four years or beyond 
uh, and we have seen this actually happen. This is, we see this all the time. We have many, uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence that, um, that these, these methods really work. Some of those methods include, here's a few things, a culled curriculum. So uh, you can see, here's a, here's a typical Navare science book. Um, it's not too big, is it? Uh, it's kind of a nice, tidy little size. Um, but what, what you have to do, when you're gonna, if you're gonna teach for mastery, one of the things you have to do is cull the material down to an amount that can be mastered in the course of one year. These great big textbooks that are you know, 10 pounds and they just keep getting bigger and bigger, but the students couldn't learn what was in them to begin with, so why do we keep cramming more material in them? So the serendipitous effect of culling the material down is that A, you get a smaller textbook, but B, you get an amount that can be mastered in the course of one year, so it's an appropriate amount. Um, Another, so I'm going to keep going. If you're following my outline, I'm just going to jump right through here. Um, some of these are the same, uh, sort of in this should all be under one bullet point or one number. Cumulative assessments. This is sort of the, I like to say this is the, the crown jewel of mastery learning. Um, quizzes and tests, cumulative all year long. Now, when you tell kids, their tests and quizzes are gonna be cumulative all year long. They will probably freak out the first time you tell them because it sounds like you just told them that they can never forget anything ever again. So on the very first day of class, you need to, you need to have a big come to Jesus talk with them and, and say the following. Uh, this is a mastery-based class. You've probably never done one of these, something like this before. Here's cumulative assessments, but it's not as bad as it sounds. And here's why. Because A, in the seventh through ninth grade, we provide some study resources on the digital resources that you teachers will have if you buy them um, that you print them out, you give a copy to every student, and one of them is a weekly review guide that kind of coaches them on how to study and what to study. Um, so they'll have that, but they will also have the objectives list, which is at the beginning of every chapter. Yes, I said there's an objectives list, every chapter of every book, and um, that is a student's best friend. Here I am talking about Novare specifically, which I, I, I don't intend to do too much of that, but um, the objectives lists are, are intentionally quantifiable. So um, if it says an objectives list, an objective might be something like be able to state three properties of electrons. They will never have to know four properties of electrons on the test. They know exactly what they're accountable for. Um, I had someone ask a question in the previous session. Uh, do, do you ever get accused of teaching to the test? In fact, I think I saw his name. He may be here today uh, in this session. But um, I responded in between the sessions in an email. And I said, well, uh, in a sense, yeah, we do teach to the test. We teach to our own tests. We tell kids exactly what they're accountable for. So there's no, there's this sense of security in knowing what they're accountable for. Uh, a lot of kids often if, talk about they feel like, I, just, I don't know what's on the test. I could study forever because I never know what's gonna be on the test. Um, so we, we found a way to put that fear away. That, that is not the case because you know exactly what's on. You need to state Newton's three laws of motion. This one is just a memorization. Um, Get flashcards. You know, kids need to use flashcards for their science class. Uh, that's fine. But um, a cumulative assessment is mitigated. The fear of it is mitigated by the way the course is taught, the way the material is structured, and we, uh, they need not be uh, so worried. But they do need to study in a new way. And teachers, the first day of class, have a big serious talk with them 
and then do it again on the third day of class and then do it again on the fifth day of class and then maybe the ninth day of class but this is a this is something you, you will have to be reminding them about this over and over again in my in, in my pastoral days when i was a pastor of church one of the things that they talk about in, in vision casting uh if you've ever been on the uh, like a a building committee for a church they are always talk about casting the vision and they say that you when you're doing a building project or a capital campaign you have to cast the vision the pastor has to cast the vision from the pulpit every 30 days at least uh or the people kind of forget you know what uh, about that so you're constantly having to cast that vision and i'd say the same thing the same thing applies to mastery learning um Next is something I'm gonna, uh, called um, embedding lower level skills in higher level exercises. And so now I wanna go back to my uh, screen share, my next slide. Okay, this is not a very good graphic and I apologize, but um, let me walk you through what we're looking at here. Um, this is a close up shot of a, of a a problem set from one of our physics books. Uh, it's not important what the problem is, but you can see it's a statement, it's a word problem. And what we have circled here is what I want to illustrate. Uh, we have first we have an example of scientific notation, a 10 to the negative 18. So scientific notation example. Then we have the units, uh, a mu and a g which you all know stands for micrograms. Uh, and then below that, NS is nanoseconds, capital G, capital N is, I'm gonna give you a second to think, you know, giganewtons, right, giganewtons, and then uh, gigagrams. And then the last one, of course, is centimeters per second. Uh, so what am I illustrating here? What this is, is lower level skills embedded in higher level exercises. You learn scientific notation in seventh grade, usually. The metric prefixes, that can be learned anywhere um, in the seventh through ninth grade. Um, and the units like grams and newtons and seconds and stuff, those are all your, those are units. But um, those, what I'm saying is those are lower level skills that they learned in the seventh grade, but they show up in a ninth and 10th and 11th grade problem set. And what we're doing here is we're forcing the students to use, and you'll notice these are kind of wacky units as well. I mean, who uses giganewtons? Why would you have a problem with gigagrams in it? Well, we would on purpose because we want them to use those skills over and over so they, they get a lot of exercise and um, they, they, you know, it sticks in their memory long term. So uh, it's just one little technique of, of um, getting the information in the students' heads and getting it to stick there. That's a, one way to describe what we're doing, right? Is trying to get information off the page and in their heads. And uh, they just have to use it uh, repeatedly to help that happen. Um, some of you might be in, uh, in co-ops, I, I end up talking to a lot, a lot of schools that are co-ops, uh, hybrid schools, university model schools. Maybe they only meet one day a week, maybe two. And I, this uh, probably the most common question I get is, um, how do, what do we do? How do we spend our time? And so my answer is at my next point here, and that is spend your classroom time on classroom activities. You sure don't want to spend your time lecturing if you're on a limited um, time frame like that. And even if you have four days, five days a week in your class, um, students need to read the textbook. Uh, and Novari books are well written, they're concise, they're interesting. And so um, have them read them, they should read the book. And especially if you're only meeting one or two days a week. But then you spend the class where you spend the class time on group activities, labs, uh, you can do you can do the quizzes um, in the classroom, or you can have them have the parents do uh, administer them at home. Um, but then you can use classroom to on, on other activities. You can you can look at the homework together. 
in class. So the way this looks, students do the homework at home. They bring their paper, their half-baked homework answers to class. And then in a group discussion, you talk about what's a good answer to this question. Okay, Billy, what did you answer? He gives his answer. Okay, you got most of it. What would someone else uh, add to that answer? Now you've got, now they're encountering the material a second time and they're group sourcing the answers. They can update their homework paper and now they have something else to study from. Uh, uh, and they've encountered the material multiple times and uh, in different contexts. This is all good pedagogy. They saw it at home and then they saw it again in the classroom and then they, they, they internalized it by themselves from the textbook and then they encountered it in a group. Uh, so these are all great activities that take advantage of what we know about learning uh, to get students to learn. And then what lecturing do you do, might you do in the classroom? You might do some shoring up. And if, as you ask questions, you fire questions at them. Okay, let's just play this game. Tell me, give me three properties of electrons. Uh, oh, I can only give you two. All right, well then you, you can take the opportunity to shore up their learning in class. So you're just helping them. You're more of a coach. You're as much of a coach as a teacher um, in some ways. You can have a, uh, a question of the day. This is an idea that uh, I got from John. He told me about how, or he wrote about this in his book. Um, when students come in, if you, have, if you have five to 10 minutes in between class, students often will come in, they'll dump down their, their backpack, and then, they're, and then they're just idling for a few minutes, talking with their friends, waiting for class to start. Well, he started putting a question of the day, every day, up on the chalkboard. And they know that they're, they are supposed to come in, get a piece of paper, sit down, and start working on that question. Because that's the first thing he's going to do when he starts class, is start discussing that. So now you're buying up a few stray minutes here and there when they would otherwise be playing on their phones maybe or just goofing off and, uh, and, and, and turning it into something useful, uh, a useful review activity for them. And this would be, it would be a review type question uh, for sure. Um, another, another technique of mastery learning is um, what do you do with homework? Uh, I meet a lot of teachers who already do this, and so that's good. I'm glad to hear that. If you haven't heard why, uh, don't grade homework. All right. <laughs> a lot of times, uh, a, a teacher's greatest owner, onerous uh, burden is uh, grading papers, right? Uh, you, have a, you go home, you have a stack of papers. Well, you, you got another hour or two of work to do before you can call it a day. One solution to this is do not grade homework for accuracy. Only grade it for completion. Make sure they do it. <clears throat> so I would collect it and just look, at, look through it, make sure they took it seriously and tried. But don't grade it for accuracy. Um, and by the way, if you use our stuff, we've given them all the answers anyway in the back of the book uh, to, to calculations. So what's going on here? What's going on is that homework is, not, it, homework is a very poor assessment of student learning because you can get answers to homework in a lot of different ways that circumvent learning. And students are ninjas at this kind of thing. They, they can get it from the internet. They can get it from older siblings who took the class a year before. They can uh, copy from their friends. And so if you base a, <coughs> excuse me, if you base part of their grade, say 30, 40% on homework, you may be giving them class credit for something that they didn't really do. They just copied it somehow. And there's an incentive to do that because you attached a high percentage uh, to, to, that, to, to homework uh, for their course grade. If you don't grade it for, for accuracy, now you've taken away the incentive to cheat or to cut corners or to undermine their own learning. Now they know they have to do it because they have to learn it. And we gave them the answers anyway. So instead of 
checking a box, jumping through a hoop, instead of homework being just a task I have to get done, homework becomes uh, an exercise that I need to do because I'm going to be, I'm going to have to answer this uh, question on the, on the homework. I mean, on the, on the test, on the quiz. So, um, <clears throat> Last thing I'll say about this is that I, tr oh, I have two things to say about this. H homework, I, I like the football metaphor. Homework is like football practice. And fo at football practice, the time to drop the ball is, on, is at practice. The time to catch the ball is on game day. So you drop the ball, you drop the ball, you drop the ball at practice. So on game day, you actually catch the ball. And homework is kind of like football practice. That's the time to get it wrong. That's the time to be half-baked. That's the time to, you know, work at it and work at it and wrestle with it, exercising those muscles so that uh, on the test you can perform because that's when they should be able to perform. Uh, the last thing I'll say on this is that a lot of times, a lot of people, students, I, and certainly me when I was in school, um, use homework to pad their grade when they say, I'm not a very good test taker. Well, it's okay. You can bomb the test, but you can make it up on homework if you get a strong homework grade. Well, if they can't perform the test and they can't demonstrate they know the material on the test, and the homework was copied from the internet or from their friends, then maybe they could still get a B in the class and never have learned, never have adequately mastered the material. To They don't have a B level uh, grasp of the material, but they get a B anyway. And so this, is a, this has been going on in schools forever and we wanna, we wanna eliminate that in the interest of better learning. Um, gonna move on a little more quickly now. Eliminate ineffective question styles. Um, basically, this is just uh, don't use multiple choice. Don't use matching, don't use fill in the blank. Um, the questions that work a student's mind are calculations and complete sentence answer. Um, require accurate grammar, re require good sentence structure, take off a point for bad, for misspelled words, especially the technical terms. Um, but they need, to, they need to use their language skills, as John said before, uh, in science class, it's important. It's important for scientists to communicate accurately. Uh, they, scientists, uh, you know, they're, they're nothing if they can't communicate their findings to the world. So this is, this is also <clears throat> extremely important. Um, last on my list here is list of amazing facts. So much of what I have to say here is from John anyway. This, is his, this was his idea. He just at one point started and it was so cool. I started doing it just for fun for myself. Create a list of amazing facts. Um, I wonder if I could find my list. Um, it includes things like, um, uh, a bluefin tuna lay about uh, 20 million eggs in a year or something like that. Um, an, ele uh, an electron, what is it they say about electrons? You can't know their, their position and their vector uh, at the same time. Uh, just start as in your own reading, as you find amazing things, start, just start a list somewhere and build that list over time and use that list it'll become useful to you as you as the need arises but as you try to foster in the student your own sense of fascination with science in the world this is your ammunition um, as you talk to them so yeah um a list of amazing facts all right so what about the attitude the teacher's attitude when it comes to mastery learning um so I'm just kind of more of the same. Uh, the first is require students to show their work. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was horrified when my kids were going to a private Christian school, classical school, and then I kind of look over their shoulder at what they're doing and they weren't showing their work. 
and I thought, you have to show your work. And they're like, oh, the teacher doesn't make us show our work. And I said, well, I'm your teacher and I want you to show your work. Um, I think teachers should require students to always show their work. Um, and that there's a procedure for that in the Novara material where we teach you to actually step by step how to solve a problem and write it out exactly how to write it out. Um, believable enthusiasm. Um, I hope you have this. I don't know how to how to make you have it if you don't. But um, stu uh, teachers, uh, we are we are the luminaries uh, that share the love of the world the fascination of the world with our students and um, that comes from your just your own reflection on it your reading of it your your the, the the deeper you know your subject matter the more fascinated i'm sure you've become with it uh, that happened to me when i was teaching history the first the first year that i taught history ancient history i had as you know first year teacher i had to do a lot of background reading and work because mostly what I knew was biblical history back then, some Egyptian, very little Greek and Hebrew, but uh, and Roman. But um, I learned a lot, and I became fascinated with it, and so I was able to enthusiastically present that to my students. Um, insist on I already said this: accurate grammar, spelling, and complete sentences. <clears throat> so um, again, you're 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 emphasizing the importance of uh, language skills in science. These are not separate topics. These are not separate subjects um, because you don't encounter life that way. Um, you, when you encounter life, you encounter it all bundled together, uh, not compartmentalized like, like our schools um, tend to do. Students need to read the text. Um, Students often can treat the textbook like just a big, a big um, dictionary for the vocabulary words. That's where I go to get the vocabulary uh, or the answers to the worksheet, you know, and they, uh, the students often will not engage with the book at any higher level than that. Um, again, we're not, we're not trying to just get through material, check off a box, jump through a hoop. We're about doing exercises like football practice that build those build those muscles so that you can perform so um reading the text read it twice if they can i mean this is you coaching your students on how to study not just uh talking about science material but coaching them how to study you must read the chapter read it closely take notes on it and i always say don't sit down and think you're going to read the whole chapter in one sitting I'll just, I'll just bust it out or do the, all the homework exercises at one time because they, then they like, got it done. They don't have to think about it anymore. Um, I coach teachers and students and teachers to teach their students um, do a little bit every day. You'll learn so much better if you'll divide it up. If the chapter is 30 pages long and you're going to spend three weeks on it, then you read 10 pages a week or two pages a night. Um, read a little bit and, and or maybe you maybe you maybe you can economize a little more than that maybe three pages but it's important that uh, it for retention for mastery learning that they encounter the material day after day after day and do only do a few exercises not the whole problem set sit down and do a few exercises not only does this um, help them to learn better but it also prevents the craziness and you know uh, the, the the complaining of uh, this is too difficult. Now you can with only maybe twenty minutes a night devoted to science. That's all you may. That's all they may need to, depending on what grade level. But that they may get away with fifteen minutes to to thirty. Maybe maybe more is needed. But what they're going to devote to their science study in the evenings does not need to be two or three hours if they break it up, and it's better learning anyway. Um, Model precision, attention to detail, love for your subject, fascination, and wonder. Um, kids come into the world not understanding the importance of uh, precision and attention to detail. Uh, but this is one of those life skills, a life that you convey to them that they that is an, the science classroom is a natural place for this. 
Um, which uh, I, I'm going to talk about experiments in a moment, but precision is is critical for your science experiments, right? And if they get it wrong, if they find, wow, my experiment didn't turn out the way I was expecting it to, one of the things they're going to need to look at is their precision. I mean, their their you know their measurement um, accuracy. Uh, Precision, measurement precision. Um, I'm getting those terms mixed up, but you know what I mean. Um, attention to detail. This, <laughs> sorry, they um, paying close attention. You're going to teach them at some point what meniscus is in a test tube, and um, they're going to notice that wow, that tiny bit of the meniscus is going to uh, is going to have an impact on my calculations. Yeah, these things matter. So, uh, and that's a life skill that they'll take with them. Okay, what's on the student's side? What what the student has? What does the student need to do in the in a mastery context? Well, we're breaking bad habits uh, and and uh, practicing these mastery methods that I've already kind of talked about a lot of them. But um, they're going to come to your class with a lot of bad habits. Um, we're going to resist the attitude of dominance uh, over nature, or or a wrong definition, a, a wrong notion of what dominion means. Oh, we're Christians. The the Bible tells us to rule the rule the world and subdue it. Um, that sounds, you know, that sounds very empowering. Um, I recently looked up these words uh, in Genesis three, um, and did a little word study on subdue and um, rule the world and subdue it, and it's not what it sounds like. Um, it's a very, it does, it, it conveys the idea, like I said earlier, of taking something wild and making it tame. Uh, the word subdue is actually the word that is used like when you put the, you know, the, your foot on the, the neck of a wild animal. It's not, crushing it. It's not for the sake of crushing it or, um, you know, celebrating a, a, your, your power over it. It's for the sake of closing its sharp teeth, subduing its wild impulses. And, and the idea of ruling is um, when the king goes out and rules the people from among them. This is what, this is emphatically what Jesus did. The king of the universe came and walked among us. That's what dominion, that's what ruling indicates in that Old Testament word. Um, it's when the king is ruling his people from among them. So it's actually quite a beautiful notion and underscores our, 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 our ideas of stewardship and loving um, relationship with the world. Um, okay, next, resist scientism. Scientism, uh, <clears throat> if you don't know what it is, it, it may be kind of just what it sounds like. Any kind of ism is uh, uh, an, an ideology of taking whatever and making that your one, uh, your one grid through which you understand the world. You know, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, in scientism, it's the approach that we can, inter we can understand the whole world through science. Science can tell us everything. Scientism means um, science is the coolest thing, and it's really the best thing, and it 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 really offers the most um, valid view of the world. So many many secular people um, act this way and talk this way. Many scientists um, speak this way, uh, but I I think we should resist it. There, science is not the only voice that tell that has anything to tell us um there's a um there's a saying i read somewhere that in our world science has take has become what the church used to be in the middle ages science now tells us who we are our identity it tells us where we came from it tells us our value. Um, it feeds us. It 
gives us transportation, shelter, it, it, it cures us of our diseases. Um, if you read the Brothers Karamazov at any point, you remember the story of the Grand Inquisitor. I think he mentions this. Um, that's a rabbit trail I don't have time to go down. But if you know what I'm talking about, cool. We would talk offline about that. But um, what the church used to give us in terms of answers about identity and, and our place in the universe, science is now largely taking that place. So resist that. Scientism. Cultivate respectful dialogue about issues. Um, that is uh, self-apparent. Um, so I don't need to elaborate on that. Respectful dialogue. That's the key. Let me talk for a minute about experiments. And then I'm just going to race to the end here. Uh, the purpose of experiments, I would say, is not to, not to, is not about discovery. It's not about inculcating ideas, uh, uh, scientific concepts. It's not about teaching. The, the best thing about experiments is bringing the student into the environment of a scientist, into the, la the lab, wearing a, la a lab jacket, and putting on not natural not gloves, and a handling apparatus, and stuff like that. Taking notes, drawing diagrams, doing predictions and calculations, making hypotheses, um, speaking the language, and walking around in that air. Um, that's why the experiments that we have in the Novari material, um, they can frequently be uh, like almost trivial, or sometimes they require some kind of wacky uh, contraption, or sometimes they involve getting out in the parking lot and pushing a car around in the parking lot, taking measurements. But the thing is, um, taking measurements uh, is what it's about. Um, modeling the experience of real science uh, okay, here's, here is another example. The, the first one in the physics book is a simple pendulum motion. Take a string, put a weight on the end of it, and you measure it as it goes like this. And um, very simple, right? Um, and it's not about illustrating pendulum motion. It's not about teaching them what a pendulum is. They don't need that. There's another purpose for that experiment. It's actually more meta level. It's things like your first, this is your first experiment about taking measurements. It's about precision using a little, using a stopwatch and a few things like that. And then writing a lab report about it afterward. It's not about inculcating knowledge about pendulum motion. Um, there's something about handling apparatus and things. Uh, like there's one experiment that calls for a, a sheet of copper or brass, like a a square of brass, it's about that big. You can, I think you can get these at a metal shop or maybe not at Home Depot, but um, you can get them at a metal shop. Have you ever handled a piece of brass like that? There's something about the tactile experience of just handling it. It's, it's, you know, some two or three pounds, but there's something weird about it. It's just very fascinating. We have an experiment, I think that involves friction. That's why, that's why you had that, but, um, but um, you can get, uh, what about scales? You can use a digital scale. And if your funds are tight, then you might have to use a digital scale. They're $10 at the grocery store. Or if you have the resources and a, you know, a budget for, a, a good budget for your lab, you might consider getting a triple beam balance. Now they're, they're $100 or more. But have you ever fiddled with one? They're kind of fun. It's kind of fun in its own just to figure out how it works. Learning is taking place right there. Unintended learning that just kind of happens in the lab. And um, you, can, you can get a plastic uh, graduated cylinder for two or three dollars. Or you can get a Pyrex one if you have the money. But handling a Pyrex cylinder or beaker or whatever is just a different tactile experience and so we say if you're if you're on a budget you can use these other things and that's fine but if your school has the budget for you and your size in your lab um, equipment for these other things maybe sometimes you can get the more expensive thing but it's um, it's great it's great for learning 
uh, the more you can get in kids in contact with that. They sure don't want to go off to college and having never handled um, a beaker before. Uh, so there, I've covered several of, of my points there. Last in the lab experiments, embrace failure. A lot of homeschooling moms I talk to are like, oh, our, our lab experiment, I'm so afraid of it. It's my worst, my worst fear because what if it doesn't turn out the way it's supposed to? She's expressing that she feels like a failure. Oh, we failed. And, and I said, you know what? You, you learn just as much, if not more, from a failed experiment than one that goes off as planned. Oh, it did what we thought it would. Well, what did we learn? Uh, ah, but what did you learn if it failed? Because now you gotta go back and figure out and start thinking about. And, and, and the Student Lab Report Handbook talks about this. What, what process of questioning needs to go on as we try to figure out where the error lied? Was it in our measurements? Was it, you know, it could be many things. But the process of thinking through that is difficult mental exercise that is so good for students. Thinking about what you did wrong is super healthy. That's like spinach for your, your student's brain. Um, because it's, there's some kind of natural resistance to it um, that we've observed. Uh, students just want to go, uh, it didn't work, you know, and, uh, and be bummed and like forget about it. But interacting with why it failed is, um, it's just a really, it's really a strong, important exercise that you don't wanna, you don't wanna pass up on. Lastly, John talked about this some as well, navigating controversies. Where is my PowerPoint? Okay, I do have one more, um, one more slide for you. What is a theory? Let me uh, again share my screen and show you this, uh, this graphic. <clears throat> All right, um, you may have seen this in the last, uh, the last presentation that John did. Uh, what you have here is we call it the cycle of scientific enterprise. Um, if uh, scientific method is one of your things that you talk about, um, it has uh, some usefulness that is limited, but um, this is a really good graphic that illustrates the how science works. And you can find this in every Novari textbook. So if you have a book, then you already have this illustration. Start on the left side with theory. You have a theory, and a theory is just a model. Um, a theory is a mental model that tries to explain data and facts, facts or data. Um, and it's our best explanation at present. In other words, it's provisional. We might get other information later that will require us to come back and modify our theory. If, it, if, if enough in information comes along that cripples the theory so bad, we may have to throw the theory out and replace it with a new theory. And a theory is a model. Then we throw one model out and replace it with another one. And then that theory can inform us on developing new hypotheses. Hypotheses inform us to make new experiments and new analysis. And um, you, can, you can read this, but um, it's important to see that this is, how, this is how science works, this is how theories work. A theory is not a truth claim. People often treat it like it is. Uh, theories are mental models, not truth claims. And so, a theory is um, neither, neither true nor false. Theories are not true or false. Theories are either strong or weak based on their ability to explain the data. This is so, so important uh, that you convey, and it's in, it's in several of the Novari books. Uh, there's a chapter that, that covers some of this, but um, you should, once your kids understand this, then from now on, when someone says, well, that theory is not true, you need to go, ah, 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 no. We don't talk that way. Theories are not true or false. Theories are what? Strong or weak, based on their ability to explain data. Uh, and facts change, scientific facts change. Um, 
it used to be a scientific fact that Pluto was the ninth planet of the solar system. And then it was not, uh, no longer scientific fact. And then it was again, and I don't know, I'm not even sure where it stands right now. It kind of goes back and forth. Um, it used to be a scientific fact that, um, that there was something called ether in the air. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know what it was, but it was a theory that was overturned. Uh, it used to be a fact that the, uh, the plum pudding model of the atom used to be the scientific fact, and that was thrown out and turned into some other model. So scientific facts change. Um, I would encourage you to teach the controversies. Don't avoid them. Uh, but like, a, like, a, like an economics professor, who is going to talk about Marxism, um, talk about it. Don't be afraid of it. And if, it's, uh, if, you're, in a, if you're in a school that is, uh, is very conservative on, on issues like the age of the earth, uh, climate change, or evolution, that's okay. You should still teach those things, even if some in the school, maybe even the board members, um, maybe even yourself, maybe you take a, cont a, a contrary view on that. Maybe you take a, a conservative view on that. Um, you can teach these things the way an economics professor would talk about Marxism, a good economics professor. Uh, it, it'll, stand or, it'll stand or fall based on its own merits. So we're just talking about teaching the, the content here. Um, respect what is right in the sight of all. That's just a good principle that Paul gives us in the book of Romans. And lastly, I want to say, do not denigrate scientists of alternative views. Um, this is a principle of discipleship. You may differ with a scientist on a particular view, but don't make it ad hominem and don't, uh, don't allow your students to, to be snarky about opposing views. Um, I won't, I won't go any further on that, but uh, that's just one of the things I believe in my heart uh, that I've seen. I've seen in some textbooks that kind of do the eye roll on the page about other people think this, but, but we don't. But um, that's not mature engagement with the culture of science like I was talking about. Now, I realize I've gone over, and I apologize for that. Let's quickly switch gears. Uh, I'm gonna give it back to Emily now. And um, let's have some question and answer time. And um, if your question doesn't get answered here, then um, I'm happy to, to interact with you offline through email. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to share in a minute here, I've been collecting um, links to some of the resources that we mentioned at the beginning of this talk, especially in case you jumped in partway through. I'll share those in a minute. And there's some good conversation going in the chat box, um, teachers sharing some different resources with each other. But I wanted to throw out this question that came up because this is an excellent question for life right now. Um, Dennis asked for suggestions in engaging students in labs during distance learning. Um, so, you know, we're obviously facing some particular challenges and many of us may be online when we are not usually. Um, some of us teach online anyway. Um, but we've got this question about what what could a teacher expect students to do at home or how might do you have any ideas for how how they might conduct a labs via distance learning um, with use of tools around the house or kind of kitchen experiments or do you think those things are better conducted by the instructor, you know, uh, on video for the students yeah. to see. I have heard this question so many times, even today, I think I've heard this question two or three times. Um, and it's obviously not an easy question to answer. There are no home run answers to this question. Um, there's only, you know, limping along with uh, second rate solutions. Um, any conceivable subject you might encounter in a high school science class, there are 20 YouTube videos illustrating that principle. So um, <clears throat> I, would, I would harvest uh, YouTube um, as one, one possible solution. I would even recommend that as a, a secondary 
explainer of concepts that, you know, if the student's like, I'm reading this, I just can't understand it, and you want a second voice, a second teacher to explain it to you, I tell people to use YouTube. There's plenty of material. You can conduct the experiment um, yourself and have the students watch. My own son is a graduate student in biology, <clears throat> and so he's teaching classes online this summer and in the fall, and they're having it, they're, it's all online, and he just hates it. He hates it, but he's doing the experiment there and then turning his camera on it, pointing things out, illustrating things. Um, that's just what he, it's what he has to do. And uh, he's, he's telling me the other day, it takes, I feel so bad for these, these students. It just takes all the fun out of a microbiology class when you have to watch someone else do it and you can't mix the Petri dish or whatever yourself. Um, other subjects may lend themselves better to doing it at home. So that pendulum experiment I talked about earlier in the physics class, they can certainly do that and everyone should. You should have you know, 20 students, they should all have 20 pendulum experiments going on, take their measurements and, um, and proceed as if they were in a class. Um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be touch and go for each, each um, experiment. There might be a lot that, that, that people can pull off at home and um, other ones that you just have to do for them. So maybe a, maybe a mixture uh, at home and, and virtual. Um, we had sort of a connected question um, about how many labs do we suggest students doing throughout the year? And now that, that could be online, we're obviously in some particularly unusual circumstances this year. Um, with school, but uh, for our different grade levels, I kind of answered the question earlier in the chat, but I just thought I'd bring it up for everyone here. Um, how many experiments are we talking about doing throughout the year for different grade levels? Um, so some of the things I mentioned in the chat box were that we obviously have different expectations for labs um, for students of different ages. We're, you know, we're expecting them to, to learn more, to learn deeper, to go a lot farther on a lab report, for example, than in ninth grade and up than they would be in middle school. But you want to expand on that? Sure. Yeah. So as Emily said, uh, the younger grades, seventh, eighth grade, we tend to have more experiments available to them, uh, 12, eight to 12 experiments in those, in those books because they're younger and um, they just need the, the, the interaction of, a, of an experiment more, uh, but they're not writing a full lab report at that point. They might be writing a short report, okay? But in ninth grade, that's when we start having them write a full lab report. Now, a lab report is a two-week assignment, and so you can't have too many in the course of the year because it's a, you know, you, there's just not enough time. Um, in, the, uh, in the ninth grade classes, we have um, five to six experiments per uh, in the year. That's going to be about one every couple of months. Um, in chemistry, if you uh, if you read in the introduction to our chemistry experiment book, it's a, it has what's called a ec core economy core. The, the book has like 17, 18 experiments in it, but you probably can't pull off all of those in the course of a year, but there's about seven or eight experiments that are specified in the introduction that these would be good to do. Uh, you, can find, you can find that there. So, and then in the, in the senior elective physics class, um, there are six physics experiments there. Our forthcoming biology book is going to be completely different. The experiments there, there's going to be some 40 to 45 activities in that experiment book. Uh, those are going to be some that are only 10 minutes long. So there'll be some activities that can, you can do in brief, and then some that would be in a whole day, a whole class period. Uh, typically three, two to four activities each chapter. So this book is going to be a little bit of a departure what we've done in the past. It's going to have um, a, a lot more to do and, uh, and they'll be optional. You know, you don't have to feel you have to do every uh, activity, but we're pro providing several options for each chapter. Um, and that's, an, that's another thing I would say um, in your context, in, in, in COVID days and um, with the limitations that we have, 
and limitations in time, sometimes you, you don't need to feel pressured that you have to do every experiment that we put in the book. Sometimes you just are not able to do it. Like uh, something that requires a lot of preparation in advance or something that requires uh, dangerous chemicals, um, you're, you, might, you might have to skip one or two, uh, but that's okay. It's okay. You can get by. Um, so, do you think that you think that answers the question, Emily? Whoops, sorry, I'm muted. Um, I think so, but okay. please feel free to throw in the chat box if you have a clarifying question that you a follow up question for Jeffrey. Yeah. Um, and again, please feel free to drop in the chat if you have any other questions. Um, we've got, I think, about ten minutes, nine minutes, um, right till the end of this session. Uh, so let me see. Um, we had another question um, from Alicia about um, reading and the students. Um, you were mentioning having them read at home, you know, assigning all the textbook reading outside of the class so that the class time can be spent on other pursuits um, and not reading that out loud together or assigning reading that they would do in class. Um, instead, using that to, for more engaging lab demonstrations and whatnot. Um, and she was wondering about, you know, uh, how do we know that the students are reading at home? How do we know that they're doing that work um, that we asked them to do? Um, so I answered the question a bit in the chat box. Um, and I, I, correct me if I'm wrong or expand on this if you want to. I said that it should become apparent uh, through the course of a mastery oriented course if the students are doing the work or not. Um, but would you have any other insights to share on kids reading outside of class time? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I think that when you let, when you explain to them how it, how it works, they'll realize, oh, I, I can't not read. <laughs> um, when you realize that cumulative assessments, homework is not graded and uh, but for for accuracy um that a lot more is riding on your performance on the assessments then there's no no choice and if you're not if you're not the type who's going to be lecturing four or five days a week in class then there's no other there's no other way um this is going to probably that if you have students who just resist reading and and uh, which is very, very common. Um, they, I, I, my impression when I was teaching, I, my impression was that my students were not reading much at all of the things that I assigned them. So I know that's, uh, that's prevalent. Um, hopefully it's not everyone. Hopefully you've got some students who are good students and read, but it's a subset that are not. Um, I would, you know, put on all your teacher tools, start contacting the parents and um, get them on your side. And uh, one, have the parents checking up on them at home to make sure they're reading. You can give them, you can give them a, an, a, an assignment. You can, you can give them assigned pages uh, to read. And I think we actually have some of that provided on the digital resources um, for you. There's a lesson list which has uh, uh, reading, what pages to read, what night, what exercises to do. Um, so it's not so overwhelming. So if they only know that they, if they know that they only have to read two pages tonight or three, hopefully they'll be, not be so intimidated by it and um, maybe they'll read that way. You can, um, you can require them to take notes on the reading and then check those. Um, and then I think you can, lastly, you might just appeal to them uh, on, that, on that coach level. Not as a, you know, I'm your teacher and I say, but um, I'm here to help you become all the, all the human being you can. Uh, I'm, I'm with you for this year to help you become an adult. This is not just busy work. And hopefully you can hopefully you can find enough fascination in the material to to read it. The books the the books are well written. They're concise. 
Um, they're <clears throat> uh, a, a conversational a lot of the time, and people have said they've found, students have testified that they found it very readable. So uh, with the Novari books, you have, at least you have a good tool in your toolbox uh, in, the, in the textbook that uh, avoids a lot of the, uh, avoids a lot of the things that annoy people in other textbooks. The, I mentioned being concise. Uh, there, there are other popular textbooks I know of where um, that can be very wordy and uh, students just get, you know, the reading just becomes overwhelming. And so um, we don't suffer from that problem. Um, we've got another question here, which is great. And you touched on this a bit earlier uh, And this. Let me say that a lot of the things that Jeffrey talked about are talked about at length in John's book uh, called Teaching Science so that students learn science. And I included a link to that. Um, I just dropped in kind of a big block of text there in our chat box um, with links to Jeffrey's notes for this talk, the Novare resources, all the stuff, Classical U, the mastery course that's on Classical U, um, and lastly, that book, um, Teaching Science so that students learn science. It's got a lot of really helpful stuff about mastery learning. What do we mean by that? What is it exactly? Um, and how to, in, included in that is how to grade uh, work, but that's a question that came up here just now. How would we weight um, quizzes, tests, and homework? Um, so could you touch on that again? Oh, sure. Um, <clears throat> actually, on it, in, in, in the digital resources, digital resources for every book, there is a document that's called something like, notes for teaching this class or how I taught this class. It's usually a five, five or six page document and in there is frequently a grading rubric, uh, a, a suggested grading rubric for you. So um, you, can, you can look up that. Um, <clears throat> when we say we don't give, we, we don't give credit for homework uh, as part of determining, determining the grade, I'm talking about high school. In the, set, in the middle school grades, your students just you might you just might need to throw them a bone. You might just need to make it five to ten percent for homework. Uh, they just may need something because they're young, and um, they may need that accommodation. Um, but by the time they're in ninth grade, they should be able to be more grown up about it and not get not not and realize. And you can tell them you know what you're doing. We're not. We're not you, come on. We can't let you pad your grade with homework uh, for the reasons we talked about, because you know homework's not a good assessment of your learning. So, you know, work with me here. Let's make it. It's about it's about tests and. Uh, I think you could probably just divide it up fairly equally um, um, between assessments and the experiments, and then the written papers. Your gra um, well, the experiments is the mostly the the paper, so the lab report afterward is a big, those are, those are serious papers that require a fair bit of effort and um, writing. Um, the experiment itself could also be graded. Um, you give a grade for that, you're gonna have a, a group participation, uh, quality of their notes, because uh, everyone needs to be taking notes. Everyone needs a, a lab journal and they need to be taking serious notes. Part of, part of the experiment process experience is learning how to take notes. You write down every student's name who was here in our participation, what time of day it was, the, uh, what the temperature in the room was, all the, ex all the factors that might have some impact on the experiment. Um, and it all needs to be journaled and stuff like that so um so there you go yeah that's great um something we talk about a decent amount at navare in cap is um, learning to think like a scientist and teaching students what that means how to think like a scientist and jeffrey talked about that a bit earlier with um with uh you know how how do we talk about theories for example um but there's a lot again a lot of information about that in john's book teaching science um and really at the beginning of every textbook there's some kind of discussion uh, about that you know how are we using scientific terms and, and things like that 
Um, we are at our time for the end of this talk, but I did drop in. Um, we have an email address for science questions, um, science at classicalsubjects.com. It's down there in the chat box. So if you have questions, please do email us. Um, we want to make sure that you have what you need um, to do science well this coming year. Especially if you're using Novari, we can answer questions a lot more specifically about the curriculum. Um, but we thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you all very much. It's been, a, been, a, been my pleasure to be with you. Have a good day. Uh, yes, Jenny, I see your question about rec recordings. Yes, this is being recorded as are all the sessions from this week. And you will get an email next week with a link to all the recordings. So um, I don't believe you should need to register for any of the talks if you like miss something, you should just have all of the resources available to you at the end. Um, but those will be out next week. So keep an eye out for an email. Yeah, they'll okay. be on the CAP uh, YouTube channel. If you, yeah. miss the, if you miss the email, just go to the CAP YouTube channel and it'll all be there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Have Thanks. a great day. Bye-bye.